Do you like putting your enemies through the blender? Well, let's build a meat grinder with a wicked backstory. I'm sure at least some of you watching know what this genie warlock combo is all about, but I wanted to add a few changes to my version, as well as explore the many possible options for this build while also creating strong origins and motivations for the character itself. But before we even get to all that, let's talk about ability scores. To keep things fair and consistent, I'm starting with my typical point by method here, but feel free to roll some dice if you'd rather do that. From there, without revealing too much, the build I'm making is going to be relying mostly on charisma, which should surprise exactly no one but I'll also want a pretty strong dexterity score as well, and you'll see why in just a moment. So with both of these scores at 15, we'll give ourselves a 13 at constitution because that'll surely come in handy for concentration saves and some extra hit points, a 12 in intelligence, and eights in both wisdom and strength because I don't see us using that too often. The race I'll be using utilizes the new custom origin rules from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. Whether you're a fan of this or not, Wizards of the Coast does appear to be moving things in that direction, so I'll be taking a plus one in charisma and a plus two in dexterity, with our stats now looking something like this altogether. If you don't like this rule and you want to use a different race, no problem. Perhaps take a look at Tabaxi, Lightfoot Halflings, Eladrin, Duragar, Tiefling, and well, there are a ton of other choices that offer a similar benefit. Now, do keep in mind that these are just suggestions and not the end all be all for all warlock stats or even possibilities for this build alone. After all, we will be multi-classing here. And with that in mind, although the majority of our levels will be in warlock, we're going to begin as a fighter. Bet you didn't see that one coming. It's true, most Warlock multi-classes see us dip into Sorcerer before anything else, and for good reason. If you can't already see at least a little of where I'm going with this, you may want to check out my Sorcerer guide here. Seriously, Sorcerer and Warlock are going to click like PB&J, spaghetti and meatballs, dino nuggets and gravy. Now I'm hungry. Speaking of flavor, that was the main reason for my choosing Fighter over Sorcerer, for now. It gives us the coveted proficiency in constitution saving throws just like Sorcerer would, as well as some abilities and narrative beats that will play heavily into this character. And it's about time you get acquainted with them. I'll be rocking up with an Earth Genasi named Wolkaroth that begins his life as a part of a tribe on the material plane that serves an enchanted forest as both protectors of a revered and ancient power and guardians against its escape. This being that they protect is what keeps their commune hidden from the dangerous outside world, and has imbued many of his people with a small measure of magical talents by birthright. From the cracks in their skin sprout many varieties of plant life, vines, and flowers, but Wolkaroth has no such gift as of yet. He's a bit of a late bloomer, if you will. Seeing all of his peers with budding gifts drives him away from tradition, and he begins training himself physically and sneaking out to visit a human settlement at night against the advice of the tribal elders. Nurturing his curiosity into a talent for sneaking out, hunting food, and visiting with the surrounding villages explains his propensity for dexterity and charisma, but it also eventually brings the elders' warnings to bear consequences. After a night of gallivanting around, Wolkaroth returns to find his home destroyed and the people he grew up with slaughtered by a well-equipped group of bandits that heard about the ancient power they guard from the drunken lips of our hero himself. As fate would have it, he arrives just in time to steal the relic containing this great power out from under the bandits and escape into the night. And that is where our hero's adventure begins. Depending on what level your group starts at, you can easily move things around, but we'll be soloing fighter for quite a bit anyway. This in mind, I won't be covering every single feature and spell gained in this build, otherwise we'd end up with a video that's way too long. But I'll make sure to link any of my class guides as we go along just in case you want to know more. Now, I already mentioned that we'll get proficiency in constitution saving throws, but we'll also get proficiency in all armor, shields, simple and martial weapons, strength saving throws, and any two skills from acrobatics, animal handling, athletics, history, insight, intimidation, perception, and survival. With the flavor of our character so far, I'll be taking survival and perception, but feel free to pick something else if you'd rather. History in particular was something I thought might be a good fit for this character. 
It's why I ended up taking the history and religion proficiencies with the inheritor background. After all, he is inheriting the will of his entire tribe at this point. Of course, we'll also have a D10 hit die as a fighter, so we'll actually be one of the more sturdy members of our party at this point. We'll also get to select a fighting style, and spoiler alert, I'm going to be taking archery for a static plus two bonus to attack rolls with ranged weapons. And we'll even get second win for even more staying power by regaining 1D10 hit points plus our fighter level as a bonus action once per short rest. But this is all pretty standard fighter stuff as is our very important second level pickup of Action Surge, which allows us to take an extra action once per short rest. Not an extra attack, an extra action. This will make us pretty clutch as a fighter early in our adventures, but it gets even better later. Just wait. At third level, we'll get to pick up our Martial Archetype subclass, and we're going with Arcane Archer, one of my personal favorites on flavor alone. Really, I just love making ranged characters and having a little extra magical ability added in there is icing on the cake. Plus, this actually works really well with what we're going to do later. You see, carrying this relic from our tribe with us has bestowed some small amount of magical power. Finally, the arcane abilities of our birthright begin to blossom and Wolkaroth eagerly accepts his rite of passage. Choosing this subclass will grant us several things, including proficiency in either arcana or nature, we'll choose nature for flavor, and either the prestidigitation or druidcraft cantrip. Again, for flavor, we're taking druidcraft. But what's most important for us is the arcane shot feature we get at this point. This allows us to combine a little extra magic into an arrow we fire from a short bow or long bow as part of an attack action that we take once per turn when we hit a creature with that attack. Though we'll only have two uses of this per short rest, it'll do what we need it to. Don't worry. We'll also get to choose two types of arcane shot here, and we'll be taking Grasping Arrow and Shadow Arrow. The latter of these could really be anything, but I like having the option to blind our enemies and dish out a little psychic damage. The former, however, will be integral to our strategy later. Grasping Arrow flavorfully causes poisonous brambles to constrict our target on a hit, dealing an extra 2d6 poison damage and reducing its speed by 10 feet. From there, the creature will take an extra 2d6 slashing damage the first time each turn it moves at least one foot without teleporting. These brambles will persist for one minute or until the creature or any other creature that can reach it burns an action to free the target using a successful athletics check against our arcane shot DC, which is eight plus our proficiency bonus plus our intelligence modifier. But wait, isn't our intelligence kind of bad? and this deals poison damage, isn't that bad too? Look, I know creatures are going to break out of this pretty easily, and I know the poison damage is a bit of a miss as well. Don't worry, it's all according to plan, you'll see. At fourth level, we're going to be a little bit boring and increase both our dexterity and charisma with an ability score improvement. It'll give us a boost to our dexterity modifier, but our charisma is left at a 17. We'll address that in just a moment, but it's worth noting that you could leave this class at this point if you'd prefer, taking both of those increases in charisma for an 18. I just think it's a good idea to stick it out in fighter for a little bit longer, just so that we get that extra feat or ability score improvement at sixth level, as well as as an extra attack at fifth level. Both of these levels just feel too good to miss after taking the class this far. However, with that sixth level boost, I'm going to opt for a feat this time, taking telekinetic with a plus one to our charisma so that we can now make use of our bonus action to move enemies and force them to take the extra bramble damage from our arcane shot, at least on the turn that we land it, or even more often if they fail the save to remove it on their turn. Additionally, I'm going to assume that we've acquired some good armor so we can take full advantage of all the proficiencies we get from starting in fighter. So let's tack on some breastplate and give our AC a boost to 16. It's nothing crazy, but anything is better than going without, and our strength isn't really good enough for something better without imposing disadvantage on our stealth checks. To this point, we've made a pretty capable fighter in their own right, but to Walkroth's surprise, the relic we've kept from our home begins speaking to us. 
making promises of greater power in exchange for our continued protecting of it. And so we begin our foray into warlock levels, choosing the Dao Genie as our otherworldly patron, an option that you may have guessed already given the flavor up to this point. Right away at our first warlock level, we'll gain access to an expanded spell list that includes some options that are integral to this build, a genie's vessel, which will just be our heirloom relic, and access to the beautiful, wonderful, glorious Eldritch Blast cantrip. Yes, of course, our archery attacks will still be better to use for now, but I promise we'll be making use of both soon enough. Before we get too ahead of ourselves, let's delve into what we get with the genie's vessel. To start, we'll be able to enter the vessel as an action and utilize a 20-foot radius cylinder that's 20-foot tall as well. While inside, we can hear our surroundings outside of the vessel, and we can leave items there when we leave after we use a bonus action to exit, or after it's been two times our proficiency bonus number of hours. Now, we can only do this once per long rest, but it's going to be huge for our character as an easy way to get a short rest and replenish our second wind, action surge, arcane shots, warlock spell slots, and more. We can just have our party hang on to the relic while we take a little nap, but that's just the beginning. Also with our Genie's Vessel, we'll get Genie's Wrath, an ability that allows us to deal proficiency bonus extra bludgeoning damage once per turn when we hit with an attack roll. Sure, this doesn't seem like much now, but it will add up, and like most other things I've called attention to here, it'll get way better in just a moment. It's also worth noting that the vessel itself can be destroyed, so we'll want to be careful with it. Its AC is equal to our Warlock spell save DC, which is 8 plus our proficiency bonus plus our charisma modifier, and although it is immune to poison and psychic damage, it only has hit points equal to our Warlock level plus our proficiency bonus. So it's pretty fragile right now. But Wolkaroth will be surprised to find that the vessel can be remade as part of a one-hour ceremony that can be performed during a short or long rest. Whew, that's a lot of stuff. Level 7 would seem, at a glance, to be a step back for our character, but the ability to refresh all of our short rest features by using our vessel really makes it worthwhile. Moving on to even more value, we take our second level in Warlock to get access to some really great Eldritch Invocations in Repelling Blast, which allows us to push a creature 10 feet back on each hit with our Eldritch Blast, and Grasp of Hadar, which similarly allows us to pull a creature 10 feet closer to us once per turn when we hit it with an Eldritch Blast. Some of you may know what I'm up to here, and likely saw this coming from a mile away, but for those of you that don't, Allow me to enlighten you. At our third Warlock level, we gain access to second level spells, and thanks to our Dao Genie patron, one of those spells is Spike Growth, probably the most important piece of this puzzle. This spell allows us to create a 20-foot radius circle of spiky terrain within 150 feet of us that becomes difficult terrain and then deals 2d4 piercing damage to creatures for every 5 feet that they move through it. Though this spell does require concentration, it is every bit worth it because the appearance of this terrain does not look intimidating at all to creatures that might enter it until it's too late, unless they can succeed on a perception check against our spell save DC. But we have advantage on our concentration saving throws and we may very well be pushing enemies into this circle of death whether they go willingly or not. The idea at this point is to throw out our spike growth as an action. Then, Action Surge to slap them with a couple of Eldritch Blasts, forcing movement and scraping them across our spikes, or a Grasping Shot to tack on some extra movement damage, and then lay on some extra bludgeoning damage from our Genie's Wrath, and finally bonus action some Telekinesis to push them around that much more if they fail the save. All this extra damage really adds up in a big way, and you should be able to keep your enemies within your spike growth quite easily too. But believe me, this will get even better as we go along. And even though spike growth is likely to be what we burn most of our spell slots on, it couldn't hurt to pick up a couple of options like the Mind Sliver Cantrip, Armor of Agathis, Shatter, and maybe even Scorching Ray. Still in our third level of Warlock and our ninth level overall, we'll take the Pact of the Chain as our Pact Boon so we can have a helpful little familiar from our Genie Patron. I'd opt for the Imp here, but there are other options that are perfectly viable too. Honestly, the biggest benefit we'll see from this is the ability to have our little familiar carry around our Genie Vessel while we rest within it so that the rest of our party doesn't have to be burdened with it. 
because truthfully, Wolkaroth may not trust them with the vessel in the first place. And because you can hear outside noises from within the vessel, and because you can telepathically communicate with your familiar from within the vessel, so long as it's within 100 feet of it, you can even role play from within the vessel while you short rest and replenish all of your abilities. Really, this kind of interaction sounds like a ton of fun to me anyway. Moving right along, our fourth Warlock level sees us gain yet another feat in Crusher, which may seem like an odd choice for a build that deals so much piercing and slashing damage via our arrows and our spike growth. But don't forget that we're dealing a bit of bludgeoning damage via our Genie's Wrath ability, and this feat will allow us to push our targets five feet in any direction when that happens, leading to more damage. Not to mention that we'll get to increase our constitution to a nice even 14. Oh, and we'll even give advantage on attack rolls against that creature until the start of our next turn if we score a crit on an attack that deals damage with our Genie's Wrath. So at this point, we're going Nova with our action surge for spike growth, shifting our enemies all over the place with Eldritch Blast, the Crusher Feet, and the Telekinetic Feet, and we can even tack on some extra damage with our Grasping Arrow. But if it feels like all the work we put in for Arcane Archer are going a bit to waste, you've discovered exactly why we need to leave Warlock for just a bit. Starting at 11th level, not only will we get three beams of Eldritch Blast when we cast it, but we'll also take our first level in Sorcerer. I mean, come on, you didn't think I wouldn't take this, did you? As prolonged exposure to the source of his tribe's power awakens Wolkaroth's latent potential, even further than just an arcane archer, he is given the gift of wild magic. Luckily, we won't even have to worry much about our spellcasting ability and spell save DC since Sorcerer uses the same calculation from earlier. And this multi-class will grant us new spell slots to use that are separate from our Warlock slots. Oh, also, if you want infinite slots and your DM allows some extra cheese at the table, go check out my Sorcerer guide that I mentioned earlier. Seriously, that's just another cherry on top of this build. Anywho, if you aren't already familiar with one of the most famous or infamous sorcerer subclasses, Wild Magic Sorcerer is one that gives us a chance to roll a d100 to determine a magical effect from the Wild Magic Surge table when you cast a leveled spell. Don't worry, most of these effects are good and they won't trigger every time, just about 5% of the time actually. What's really great about this subclass is the Tides of Chaos feature that we get at first level. This will allow us advantage on one attack roll, ability check, or saving throw once per long rest. And you'll regain the use of that feature if your DM later forces you to roll on the Wild Magic Surge table after casting a leveled spell. Auto advantage whenever we need it? Don't mind if I do. But what we really want from this class in general has nothing to do with wild magic. We're here for the sorcerer staple of meta magic, which truly comes online at third level. Using a resource called sorcery points, we'll be able to alter our spells with certain effects, of which we can choose two at third level. For those choices, we'll take subtle spell in case we're worried about one of our spells getting counterspelled by our opponents, and quicken spell. This second meta magic option will help us bring grasping arrow back back into the mix for even more insane Nova damage in the first round of combat. So now we can start our turn by hitting an opponent with a grasping arrow along with an extra arrow to the knee, we'll quicken spell spike growth as a bonus action before rounding things off with an action surged batch of Eldritch Blasts with Genie's Wrath and some extra forced movement for a ridiculous amount of damage off of spike growth as well as the grasping arrow. And taking one more level in Sorcerer, we'll use an ability score improvement to max out our charisma at 20 before moving back to Warlock for the remainder of the build. Yes, this will only leave us with four sorcery points to use that only come back after a long rest. However, we can convert spell slots into sorcery points if we need more. And we happen to get our Warlock slots back on a short rest anyway, which we will basically get for free thanks to our genie's vessel being carried by an imp familiar. On top of all that, when we get back to Warlock for our fifth level in the class, we'll immediately get another Eldritch Invocation and we'll be taking Agonizing Blast. 
This will take the plus five charisma modifier we just earned and tack it on top of all three of our Eldritch Blasts for even more damage. Our sixth level in Warlock will see us gain resistance to bludgeoning damage and a bonus action 30 foot flying speed that lasts for 10 minutes, which can be extremely helpful for pushing other flying enemies down into our spike growth with our repelling blasts. And we can do this proficiency bonus times per long rest, so we're unlikely to ever run low. In the worst case, it just provides us with some extra evasion and mobility. 17th level sees us gain yet another Eldritch Invocation as well as an extra beam when we cast Eldritch Blast. This really seems like the perfect time to take Lance of Lethargy so we can reduce an opponent's movement speed by 10 feet once per turn when we hit them with an Eldritch Blast and keep them within the bounds of our spike growth for even longer. At 18th level we can use an ability score improvement to max out our dexterity score or we can even use a feat like Spell Sniper or Lucky to great effect. I think I'll go with the lucky feat just in case we somehow whiff on something and don't already have our Tides of Chaos advantage to use up. At 19th level, we'll get our final invocation for this build and I'll choose Eldritch Mind for advantage on our concentration saving throws since we'll be relying so heavily on spike growth. Though, one could certainly make the case for taking this even earlier. Now before we round off this build, let's talk spells. I've refrained from listing out some good picks up until now since so much of this relies specifically on spike growth and our multi-classing back and forth means we won't have particularly high levels in our spell slots. But at this point and at the end of our build, we'll have two fifth level warlock slots and we likely won't want to waste those on spike growth we should probably just use our sorcerer slots instead since spike growth gives us no benefit for upcasting it. For our other high level spells, it might be worth taking a look at Synaptic Static, Rallathim Psychic Lance, Blight, and Banishment. You'll notice I mostly stayed away from concentration spells since our concentration will already be accounted for, but Banishment is just too hard to pass up if you'd rather take some enemies completely out of play rather than grind them into meat paste with spike growth. Finally, at level 20, our 10th Warlock level, we'll get access to a feature that's really better than just about any other capstone from the three classes we used in this build. Sanctuary Vessel will allow us to take up to five willing creatures within 30 feet of us into our vessel and complete a short rest in just 10 minutes, with the extra ability to add our proficiency bonus to any hit points they regain by spending hit dice in the process. Wow. This build is really insane and quite a bit more sustainable than you'd think thanks to the genie's vessel, but it is a level 20 build and very few campaigns will ever make it quite to that point. So let's explore some options for lower levels of play. Firstly, let's address the elephant in the room. It's not really necessary to take fighter in this build if you'd rather just go sorcerer and warlock from the get go. I'd suggest starting with Sorcerer if you do so you still get proficiency in constitution saving throws. Rolling it together that way can get you spike growth, meta magic, and some forced movement options as early as 6th level, but I rather like the extra flavor, damage, armor proficiency, action economy, and hit points that we get from Fighter. Realistically, this build reaches a fever pitch around 14th level, but I also made sure to build it so it's viable all the way up to that point too. Hell, you could even just take Genie Warlock all the way. After all, it's one of my favorite Warlock subclasses to solo, and you'd get access to both Limited Wish, the Genie's 14th level ability, and the actual Wish spell, which this build does regrettably miss out on. Looking at Wolkaroth and all of his badass Arcane Archer glory, I think it's worth it. But what do you think, and what would you have done differently? Feel free to let me know down in the comments, as I'm always down to explore more options for builds like this. While you're down there, don't forget to like the video and subscribe to the channel, and as always, go out there and make some chaos.